Sorry that thing's buzzing, but I'm about to play a couple of videos just because uh, I think they're cool. We, I found them over the weekend. They are relevant to the things that we saw last week in lab. It will help remind us of some of those things for a couple of reasons. There is the post lab quiz that is, I think it's now been made available until midnight, I think tonight, or actually it goes until, we looked at this, it goes until Thursday. Let's look real quickly at our D2L schedule just to see where we are at. Uh, today is the day that we are to introduce fungus, but there's a, a little bit in front of that that I wanted to do. Uh, like I said, I found these video clips over Protist. It's going to help review the things that we found in lab last time. There were a couple of examples that I realized that morning, like that uh, plasmodial slime mold that was fine on Monday, but then when we had our lab activity on Wednesday, it had already put up those little spores, those fruiting bodies, and it wasn't as easy to see um, what that was supposed to look like. So I found some videos I thought we could look at. It will help review the things that you might find on post lab quiz three, which is available to the end of the week. And then the other kind of small activity that we're gonna do today, I didn't bring in the pond water last time. And that's where we're gonna find a bunch of unknown protists. So once we can kind of review things we saw last time with a couple of videos. I'm going to do a brief lecture on fungus. The fourth quiz about fungus is currently up on D2L if you want to look at it. We're going to introduce basically what a fungus is today. And then on Wednesday, we have a little bit deeper dive into fungus. We're going to look at uh, the different types of fungus. We'll have our lab activity on fungus as well on Wednesday. So there'll be another post lab quiz following Wednesday's activity uh, all about fungus. So I thought we could use today, uh, right after lecture, to do this little activity, looking into the pond water to see what we can find. Uh, and this morning we found a almost everything that we found in lab last time, we found in the pond water. Uh, so it's a really good example. And, and there are also some of the things in the pond water that we haven't seen yet, like some single-celled plants. Some stuff in there called duckweed. Uh, you can find that, it has little roots. I at least want to make us aware of the five clades of fungus and then we're going to see examples of most of those in lab. We're certainly going to introduce all five types in lab. Introduce all five types in lecture, I should say. But I can't think much further past that. I think we have a review day and then we approach our second exam, which is going to take us all the way back from prokaryotes, include protist, and then end with the fungus stuff. So there still is an opportunity to take this lecture quiz if you haven't taken it looks like that goes away at midnight tonight the other thing the protist diversity post lab quiz i said goes away on thursday and this is the new one for today the lecture quiz about fungus these are unlimited amounts of time so if you wanted to take these uh, you can go ahead and take it as many times as you like you can see we've got about 25 slides to get through but so it's not a whole lot but before we jump into that, I wanted to pull up a couple of these videos. So we had a lab activity last time, and one of the cool things that I brought out were one of these tardigrades, and, and we got to at least see this thing moving around. So the video starts out with a cool picture of one of these tardigrades. The microscopes that they're using in this video are much sharper than the ones that we have. I'm sure way more expensive than the ones that we have access to here as well. So it's really nice to get to see uh, some of this stuff in much more detail. We also, uh, there's about four clips that we're gonna see. Not, none of them are very long. I can talk through them uh, as they go. So I'll start the first one here. Starts with tardigrades, but then quickly switches to something else that we got excellent examples of last time in lab. Okay. We love them too. We love them, and we will talk about them on this channel a great deal. But we also so this dude, this dude is fired up about tardigrades, and that's what he's saying. He he will. will there's a whole other video about these, but this video switches to something else. Species that you likely have never heard of, larger than a tardigrade, though only a single cell. And the fact that you've probably never heard of Stentor is sad because they are. Wonderful, magnificent, and powerful organisms. So, center. Welcome. You're just in time. We're watching some video clips of things we saw last time in lab. We'll look at pond water to find some unknowns. Known species, but they're probably more than that. Some of them can build mucus houses that they can hang out in and hide inside of. 
Some carry algae inside of them that produce food for them, and all of them are astoundingly large for a single cell organism. Some can be as much as four millimeters long, big enough to be seen without a microscope. The biggest tardigrades, which have thousands of cells, are 1.5 millimeters long. A single-celled organism that is much larger than the tardigrades that are made of thousands of cells. So individual cell size between organisms is not uniform. These are some of the largest single-celled organisms around. Like I said, you can see them with the naked eye. We, there's a picture of one of those uh, coming up shortly. This is the one that we had in lab. In fact, we still have it back there if you want to look at it again. And, and there should be some floating in the pond water. It might be different species than the one that we had in lab. Uh, but this is the largest one. These are in the pond water, too. One thing every stentor has in common is the holdfast organelle, which lets them anchor to a single location. Now, they can swim, but in an undisturbed culture, only a few stentors will be swimming freely. Stentors are actually more dense than water, which means that they sink. So that holdfast organelle lets them save energy once they find a location that has plenty of food and oxygen. But just because they're anchored, that doesn't mean they can't move. Most stentors are also capable of stretching a huge amount. When attached and feeding, a stentor body can reach five to ten times their original length. And that's when it starts to resemble a trumpet, which is where it gets one of its common names, the trumpet animalcule. The biggest of all the stentors, and one of the largest single-celled organisms that exists, is Stentor coruleus. They can be the length of a rice grain. There are insects in your backyard that are smaller than these massive but common unicellular organisms. They're in freshwater habitats all around the world, and we, here at Journey to the Microcosmos, have a pond where we find them all the time. Surprisingly, they thrive even when it's freezing cold. We have a stentor culture set there they are. stentor coruleus collected under 20 centimeters of ice. Possibly the lack of predators during the winter. Single-celled organisms, you see all of them. Stentor coruleus is a part of a group called the ciliates. As is true of all ciliates, stentor coruleus have hair-like structures called cilia. There were two ciliates that we saw, paramecium, which is this one right here, and then stentor, which you can see is much larger than the paramecium. The beating of the cilia propels these cells in the water when they want to move around, and it also brings food particles, microanimals, and single-celled organisms into the cell mouth, where they are taken inside the cell to be digested just like this multicellular rotifer, which is swallowed by the giant stentor coruleus and waiting to be digested. We recorded this struggle for a long time and even witnessed the rotifer rupturing the stentor's cell membrane multiple times. Each time, the stentor repaired itself and the rotifer never managed to escape. After 25 minutes, the rotifer ceased its struggle. Just a reminder, rotifers have a simple brain with a simple nervous system. They can feel, I'm not sure about pain, but they can certainly feel stimuli. Now, I don't know if you can see it right here, but you can see that little light sphere and there's another one right here. It's kind of hard to tell, but this is an unbroken chain of these spheres that goes all the way through this organism. You can see a, some, a few of them pop back up here and then they kind of snake this little line all the way through the organism. This is what's called the macronucleus, and it's almost forms a, a ring around the perimeter of this entire cell. And we're about to see how if this thing gets chopped up into a bunch of bits, as long as there's a piece of cell membrane and some of that macronuclei, it'll be able to regenerate the entire cell. The striking blue color makes Stentor coruleus one of the most beautiful species of the genus Stentor. However, Stentor coruleus are not just big and blue. They also have many abilities you would not expect to find in a unicellular organism, including regeneration, light avoidance, food selection, and reaction to mechanical stimuli. Stentacoruleus is most famous for its regenerative abilities. If a stentacoruleus cell is cut in half, each half will regenerate into a normal-looking cell at half the size of the uncut cell. 
After healing and reconstructing the missing parts of the cell, these half-sized cells will grow to the normal cell size given time and resources. Even if the cell is cut into a hundred pieces, each fragment can eventually become a normal-looking cell, though for successful regeneration to occur, we need two things. The cut piece there it is, that organelle. part of the macronucleus and a piece of the cell membrane. Spheres. The macronucleus of Stenderferulius is visible even under low magnification. It has the look of a beaded necklace, and it extends along the whole cell. This macronucleus is highly polyploid, which means that even a fraction of the macronucleus will contain thousands of copies of the entire genome of Stenderferulius. Even a tiny fragment less than one one hundredth the size of the stentor coeruleus can reconstitute itself in this way if both the cell membrane and the macronucleus are present. Portions of stentor lacking either macronucleus or cell membrane only survive for a short time. And the whole regeneration process takes only around 48 hours. And you don't have to take our word for this. Sometimes, when preparing slides, we accidentally cut these massive cells and the pieces of stentorcoruleus are left alive in the slide. Within a day, they are almost fully regenerated. After two days, we can't even tell which is the fragment and which are the unharmed cells. Stentorcoruleus can be cannibalistic as well. However, no one has ever managed to record the initial swallowing. This is likely because the light of the microscope disturbs the cells. Here we see a stentor making a go of that, but luckily for the little one, it's a bit too big of a bite. You can see that macronucleus really well right there. Okay, I'll pull away from that one for just a second because there is also another one that I wanted to introduce we didn't get to see very well last time, and that's the movement of that plasmodial slime mold. When it's still trying to feed and it's finding nutrients, it's spreading its cytoplasm out like this. But when it runs out of food, we're going to see that it puts up these little spores, these little fruiting bodies. That's another thing that it has in common with fungus. It travels, it moves to a new area by putting up these tiny little spores that are blown by the wind and they produce thousands of spores, and the hope is that one of those spores will land in an area where there's nutrients. Most of them won't, and they won't ever germinate. Um, let's see this plasmodial slime mold in motion. Microcosmos, on the other hand, got to its experiments long before we did, giving us slime molds. A slime that not only lives, it learns. A slime that fuses microbes together to create a living thing that grows into something we can observe with our own eyes. You may have seen slime molds before, their bodies sometimes laden with spores as they grow on plants and decaying wood. That's what happened to ours on Wednesday. It put up all these little spores. Those were the little black clusters that we saw on the plate. In fact, we still have it if you want to see the spores. They look kind of like fungi, and for that reason, that is how they were initially classified. Except that one of the defining characteristics of fungi is their inability to absorb and digest their food internally. Slime molds, however, are plenty capable of that. They do phagocytosis all the time. So just a quick distinction again right there, since we're about to introduce fungus. Uh, one thing that this plasmodial slime mold, which is a protist, uh, and then us and the fungus all have in common is that we're all heterotrophs. We can't make our own food. We have to get it from some other source. Our digestive enzymes are on the inside. So we have to swallow food and ingest it to get it to be broken down by the enzymes. These plasmodial slime molds are like us. Their digestive enzymes are on the inside. So they've got to absorb, uh, ingest food, I should say, uh, in order to break it down. The fungus, as we're going to see at the end of this uh, lecture, are unlike us or this plasmodial slime mold in that their digestion takes place externally. Uh, and then after the digestion occurs, they secrete their enzymes and it breaks down the dead plant material outside of the fungus. And then once that's done, the fungus is going to absorb that resulting nutrient-rich goo. Um, so if the digestion happens on the inside, they're ingestive heterotrophs. Fungus are absorptive heterotrophs. Okay, just a little bit more of this. Where we see decaying matter, slime molds detect a cornucopia of microbes. Plus, 
fungi do not move, and slime molds, in their own unsettling way, do. We know now that slime molds are eukaryotes, and they're made up of amoeboid organisms, but they don't fit neatly into any of our definitions of plant, animal, or fungus, leaving them in the more ambiguous protista kingdom and clustered under the label Mycetozoa. However, that label is a, get this, polyphyletic grouping, and that means that the organisms we've lumped together as slime molds aren't necessarily all related. They've just found their way over the course of evolution into a set of similarities that is both convenient and misleading in our attempts to categorize the natural world. We mentioned polyphyletic groups earlier in Unit 1 when we were talking about trying to show evolutionary relationships between organisms. And if you just have superficial structures to go off of, you could see where people would, would maybe lump a shark in with a group of dolphins or something like that. They both look very similar. But one is a mammal that has to breathe air and has lungs, and the other one is a gill-breathing cartilaginous fish. Uh, so they only look similar because they have similar body plans and, and they share a similar habitat. These look a lot like a fungus because they, re they reproduce through spores, uh, they break down dead material, but there are some key differences between the two. Let's look a little further. There are three major types of slime molds. There are the protostelids, which are the least studied. Then there are the dictyostelids, also known as cellular slime molds. We actually have one of these in class, and it's sitting in the petri dish over there. It's currently growing, and it's in this stage right here. By the end of the semester, maybe in a few more weeks, we'll see the next stage where these individual cells will group together into one big slug and then move around the petri dish. That's right before they produce spores and try and move to another area. And then there's the myxomyces, also known as the true or plasmodial slime molds. Scientists love studying slime molds, particularly dictyostelids and myxomyces, for reasons that we will discuss soon. In fact, the slime molds we're going to show you today come from a lab though we're on the hunt to see if we can gather any of our own in our sampling tricks. This species is Physarum polycephalum, a well-studied example of myxomycetes, making it a plasmodial slime mold. We feed it oatmeal and barley flakes, keeping it in the dark because it's not particularly fond of light. We're observing our Physarum here on petri dishes because it's hard to transfer them to glass slides. This, in turn, limits our magnification, so we won't be able to see as deeply into their bodies as we might be able to with other organisms. But they are remarkable to observe as an entity with their sprawling networked branches. Now we also don't have samples of the other types of slime molds right now, so we're going to be focusing our discussion mostly on physarum and plasmodial slime molds. But both cellular and plasmodial slime molds come up often in the news because scientists have observed them doing very impressive things. But let's start out by quickly explaining the differences here. Cellular slime molds, the dictyostelids, are made up of organisms that will likely spend most of their lives as singular amoebas. This is what's currently over there in the petri dish. There's not quite as many of these things that have popped up, but if you look closely, you'll definitely see a few. But if the conditions around them become... It's about to show what happens if they, once they've kind of expanded as far as they can expand. A multicellular thing called a slug that coordinates the various cells so that they can all move to a good spot and then morph into a fruiting body that releases spores. This is what, right? They're single cells and then they get some signal that they should all come together to form an organism and spore out to create the next generation. But whilst that's a term that we're going to see as well. Fruiting bodies, when we're talking about fungus, also just refer to spore-producing structures. Cellular slime molds are made up of many cells. True slime molds, like Physarum polycephalum, are actually made up of only one cell. Yeah, 
all of that branching weirdness, that is all one cell. The life of this physarum started with the sporangia, a black globular body made by other physarum. That's the fruiting body, the spore producing structure. The sporangia holds spores that spread and eventually germinate into either an amoeba or a flagellate. Another reason they were originally grouped in with the fungus because they reproduce the same way with spores. At this unicellular stage in their lives, as you might expect, the physarum only has one nucleus. But then, the amoeba finds another amoeba to mate with. And if you've heard about a slime mold that has several hundred sexes, this is where that comes in. Each of the little cells produced by the spores has two copies of three sex genes. And each of those sex genes has their own variants across the species. Taking into account the number of different combinations of those sex gene variants that are possible, you end up with an organism whose sex is just one of hundreds, which increases the number of possible mating partners for any individual Physarum amoeba when they do find their mate. The two become one, literally. They fuse together all the way down to their nucleus. Okay, and at that point, they just continue to sprawl and feed. But I'm going to jump to another video quickly. We've seen the stentor. We've seen the slime mold. And I guess if you're keeping track, the next, the next two videos we see, we actually kind of switch gears here into new stuff for today. And that's to introduce fungus. I thought it was worth looking at some protists, especially the ones that... Uh, resemble fungus to make a distinction between those protists and the new stuff today, which is fungus. So let's introduce a video real quick. You've probably gone through something like this before you have a loaf of bread sitting around waiting to be eaten and you fully intend to eat it. You might even have had the perfect sandwich in your mind, but then you go grab some slices and you notice that someone or something got to it first. It's the mold. The dreaded hairy patches of black, blue, green, and gray expanding like a circular lawn intent on taking over your bread. It seems to come out of nowhere, but once it arrives, there is no getting rid of it. If you've been following our journey through the microcosmos for a while now, you might remember that we talked about slime molds before, so maybe it seems to you that we have covered mold already, except that when it comes to nature, it turns out that historically, humans have not been so great at naming things, which is not entirely our fault. We have, for obvious reasons, tended to use similar names to describe organisms that look similar to each other, and slime molds kind of resemble bread mold with the way they both fly around the world as small spores and the way that they both creep and spread across surfaces. But this resemblance hides some pretty big differences. For example, a slime mold is a protozoan, which means that the large organism you see is actually a single-celled eukaryote, able to push the boundaries of its one cell further and further and further. Mold, regular old mold, like the kind you see on bread, the little strands. are not anything like that. They are an entirely different kingdom, in fact. They are fungi. And there are a few fungal species that are known to make up bread mold specifically, the most common of which are the multicellular rhizopus, penicillium, and, and you can see here those tiny little spores, which are the reproducting structures, and cladosporium. As we said, fungi are their own kingdom of life, just like protozoans and plants. But while their growth and way of life might make them sometimes resemble members of other kingdoms like plants and protozoans, it turns out fungi are the animal kingdom's closest relations. Of course, family relations mean nothing when there's food on the table, and fungi are not like us. They can't just go to the store to pick up a loaf of bread. They can, however, travel, flying through the air or swimming through water as spores. These spores are kind of like seeds waiting for the right combination of temperature, acidity, and moisture to take root. 
And for some lucky spores, bread can potentially provide those conditions, especially pre-sliced bread, which has all of those nutritious nooks and crannies to grow in. There was one guy that asked me, you know, like he buys the bread, when he buys it in the container, there's no mold in there. How does the mold get in the bread? And it's in the air in tiny little spores that you can't see with the naked eye. But one of those spores lands in one of the little pockets and it's got all the nutrients that it needs to start dividing and growing. And a couple of weeks later, if you don't get through that loaf of bread, you'll see it pop up. And mold are very good at growing. Starting from the spore, the fungus begins to expand in the form of threads called hyphae. The hyphae grow at the tips their walls made out of tough but flexible chitin that allows them to get creative. Sometimes the hyphae form branches of their own, and they sometimes are. they will fuse with one another. The result is a web of hyphae called the mycelium. Now that mycelium is what we consider the body of the fungus. It's a feeding body. Uh, we'll see that each of those little hyphae are what are secreting digestive enzymes and also absorbing the nutrient-rich goo. And this thing lives hidden underground. You never see the body of the mycelium. Uh, you only see the reproductive structures that it produces after it's stored up enough nutrients. These things can be the size of football fields that live underground. And all you ever see are the little mushrooms that they use to produce spores and use the wind to carry those spores to a new location. Let's look a little closer at these hyphae. But the mycelium is not just a matter of spreading. It's a network that acts as a feeding apparatus. The hyphae will secrete enzymes into the bread around it, breaking down its nutrients so that the fungus can eat. It's basically just a really large network of mouths. This makes for a frustrating sight when you're looking at our despondent gross slices of bread, but when you see a piece of mold growing and eating away at a piece of bread, you are seeing a loose approximation of the same processes that made our world possible. <coughs> We've seen this before with lichen, a collaboration between fungi and algae. In fact, we're going to introduce three types of lichen at the end of this lecture. So we, you just kind of heard that the, a, a lichen is an association between a fungus and an algae. In fact, uh, this ascomycota group is going to be the one that produces most of these relationships uh, that we would refer to as a lichen, between a fungus and some type of green algae. It's typically that ascomycota. Um, and the last little video I introduce is also a fungus video. James came home with some samples. So once again, same guy, he's super dramatic, so that's kind of fun. But uh, in this case, they've sampled some pond water, not unlike the pond water that we have over there. And what they found in this one are these little strands of hyphal threads that happen to start to act predatorially and are going <laughs> to trap these nematode worms. They need nitrogen, and if there isn't sufficient amounts uh, in the environment, they will go to killing organisms to extract nitrogen. Let's see this. And as usual, we prepared some slides and checked on the organisms within. We'll find these and things as well. Like this one slid down on the slide, and all seemed well. So he stored the slides and his new friends in a humidity chamber and waited to observe them after a few more days. But two days later, all would not be well. This is where we build our suspense. In a movie, this would be the moment where we assess the unsettling basement of the dark woods and then consider retreating to safety. This is the creepy hall, and there hasn't been any thumps in the middle of the night. So those are some fungal spores. So everything seems okay. They're about to branch out, and you can see some Paramecium, some euglena floating around back here. We're looking at the spores of a fungus, one belonging to the group Arthrobotrys. And one is just floating around like this seems quite harmless, especially when compared to the nematodes we showed earlier, which are part of a whole family of things <coughs> that are notorious for their parasitic lifestyle. And if you were to write off Arthrobotrys as a potential threat, you would be correct most of the time. It does spend much of its life aligned with the dead, but only to sustain itself on the remains of decayed life and organic matter. Arthrobotrys species are found all around the world, occupying everything from soil to animal feces in the many varied climates.
fungus that make up our planet. And wherever it is, the fungus ensures that nutrients like nitrogen from dead organisms and other waste cycle through ecosystems. But when nitrogen is scarce, these fungi will resort to hunting it down from living sources. And what better prey than the nematode, a fellow dweller of the soil and one of the most abundant animals on Earth. When James put his slides into the humidity chamber, he had no notion of what these nematodes would be facing, and so no expectation of what he would find. But when the slides came back out, what he observed was something he'd only seen once before in a drawing done two years ago by one of his close friends, Caitlin Solbach. In it, you can see a nematode whose body had been clenched into segments by some kind of bulbous thing. What you're seeing is the fungus's most brutal design. But to get there, it must morph from decomposer to predator, no longer consuming what has already been dead, but actively killing. It begins by weaving a trap out of itself. It threads the hyphae of its mycelium out and then back in, forming a living loop that repeats to form a net. But a net is only one part of a trap. The other part is the lure. The fungi can find nematodes by following traces of their pheromones, like their breadcrumbs, and more nefariously, they can mimic the smell of certain food cues to draw the worm in, like a siren working through scent instead of song. The nematode has no reason to suspect anything, even as it swims closer and closer and eventually through the fungal rings. But as it does, the movement of worm and water triggers the rings to constrict. The worm is trapped, but the worst is still yet to come. The fungus's hyphae begin to grow off from the loop, puncturing the worm's cuticle and paralyzing it. The threads swell up into a bulb that produces more hyphae to spread through the rest of the nematode, and then the fungus feeds. I don't know if you can see it, but the hyphal threads are going through the body of that nematode and dissolving it. And feeds, quickly digesting the rest of the nematode's body. Now it has its nitrogen. Then, it is a gruesome death. Wild. I'll stop that there. Um, there's going to be more videos on fungus that we'll see on Wednesday, but uh, now that we've at least seen a few uh, moving videos of those and compared them to that plasmodial slime mold, I'll jump into our first lecture on fungus. And uh, again, this will at least get us halfway through the questions that are on quiz four currently on D2L. We'll finish the rest of that stuff on Wednesday. Let me mute that. Okay, so what we just saw in the video is that unlike us, fungus have all of their digestion occur externally, and then they have to absorb that nutrient-rich goo. So they're considered absorptive heterotrophs. We're going to see that like plants, they have a cell wall. However, uh, their, cell, uh, their cell wall is gonna be made out of chitin. I remember that matching thing I built last semester where people were trying to put biomolecules together and one of those crazy biomolecules was chitin. And I think one of the things we said about it is that it makes up the cell walls of fungus and the exoskeletons of insects. Uh, plant cell walls have cellulose. So fungal cell walls are gonna have chitin. And then the other thing here is that most of those fungus are not going to have flagella. I had to qualify that and say most because there is one primitive group over here that we call the chytrid fungus that's the only group of fungal clades that still retain flagella. That's a very primitive structure, still a relic from when these things had part of their life cycle that was an aquatic part of their life cycle. In fact, we'll see this with plants. The next unit is all about plants, and we're going to see how some of the first primitive plants still had this link with water, and we can see that at one stage of their life cycle because they have flagella flagellated sperm. And 
they eventually break that link with water and they lose their flagellated sperm. We see a similar thing in the fungus where the primitive groups of fungus still retain the flagella, indicating their roots in an aquatic environment. And then the rest of these four groups are going to break that link uh, with water and, and lose their flagella. So maybe we can put a little characteristic right here that indicates they have adaptations to land. Basically, no flagella is what I'm trying to say there. So that just separates those chytrid fungus from the other groups of fungus. E any of those types of fungus that we're talking about are all going to be comprised of these hyphae, these very thin little uh, single, I'm going to say that, it's a strand of single cells. And each one of those single cells, you can see, has a lot of surface area in relationship to its volume. That makes it very efficient at absorbing nutrients and getting rid of waste. Since it's such a, a thin string of single cells with all of that surface area, uh, like I just mentioned, they don't have to have any internal systems in order to get enough nutrients in and to get waste out. Uh, all of that just happens through exchange across the surface of those individual cells. Hyphae are going to be much smaller than plant roots. So we're going to see if I can go back to this slide or even here. Uh, these individual hyphae are going to be much better at absorbing things like nutrients and water from the soil. So they, are, they almost act like a sponge. And plants, we will see, that have an association with fungus are able to absorb more water and nutrients from the surrounding soil and can grow faster than plants that don't have an a association with the fungus. Okay, so we said fungus are made out of these strands that we call hyphae. And here are a couple of types of hyphae. There are some that have little septums between the nuclei. Some septums are going to be open with this little pore that allows cytoplasm just to flow freely from one direction to the next. The septum there separate the nuclei from one another, but like we said, the cytoplasm is not separated but can flow freely. There are some hyphae that we will see there where the pore is closed off. So it's like you have individual sectioned off cells where the cytoplasm or nuclei don't move. So septate hyphae have septa, may or may not have pores. And then there are coenocytic hyphae, which have no septa between the nuclei or the cytoplasm. So these would just be kind of like that plasmodial slime mold that we saw where the cytoplasm and the nuclei could just flow and stream in, in multiple directions. It continues to spread if there is nutrients in that particular direction and will dry up if it's spreading into an area where there isn't any nutrients. Okay, so two different types of hyphae. When we have a whole collection of those hyphae, that, that body of hyphae is what we refer to as the mycelium. We said that was the feeding body of the fungus and it can live for years underground and only when it stores up enough nutrients does it produce one of these reproductive structures. This is what we also called a fruiting body because it produces these spores. These fruiting bodies, just to focus on this reproductive structure for a second, may only last two to three days where this mycelium might spend two to three years gathering the nutrients to put up those reproductive structures. And that mycelium can't just move around. It's stuck in the soil. So if it wants to travel to a new area, it has to rely on these spores being carried by the wind Hopefully the wind's blowing in a, them in a direction that's going to land them in an area of a bunch of nutrients. So both the mycelium and these reproductive structures are going to be made out of those thin strands of hyphae. The difference between them, when we look at the different groups on Wednesday, we're going to see that the structures in which they produce those spores are going to be different. Some of them kind of look like a cup shape. The one that we have on the slide is an example of one of these cup fungus where the spores are produced in this cup shape and then they're released from the top of the cup. That's the opposite direction from this picture that we just saw. This is what we're going to call a basidiocarp that common mushroom, the last group that we have down there, has these spore producing structures where the spores drop out from the bottom. So we'll see basidiocarps, we'll see ascocarps. But when we think about the life cycle of a fungus, this, I don't think that video link worked, so I'm gonna show another video of this on Wednesday. This is what's called an earth star. Uh, I don't know if 
it was in this class or some other one that somebody had mentioned finding one of these things in their front yard. There was a bunch of them uh, in my mom's front yard not too long ago. They lived underneath this old oak tree that had a bunch of dead roots. And so these fungus are going to break down the, the dead roots underneath the ground, store up that nutrients. And then for just a few days out of the year, they'll put up these. This was a spherical looking structure that opened up. These, that's kind of what the outside area is it, it peeled back its outer layer and it revealed this very delicate little membrane and in the center of that membrane we'll see a video clip of this on Wednesday there's a tiny little pore and these open at a certain time of the year like in September or October here uh, in Texas when we kind of get the fall rainy season and a single drop of water landing on this structure it's such a thin membrane that it disturbs the surface of that membrane and that caused what what looks like a little puff of smoke to come out of that little pore. It's not actual smoke. Those little, what look like smoke are tiny little spores that are light enough to be carried by the wind, hopefully to a new location. So again, fungus are going to produce spores to get them around. If we're thinking about the life cycle of a fungus, it's interesting because it has an, it, a, let me say that again. It has an additional step that we don't really have in our reproductive life cycles. I'll start by looking at this part of the slide over here on the left, this asexual reproduction. You can think of this as that, that bread mold video that we saw where there is a spore that lands on a loaf of bread. It, it spreads out into a, a clump of hyphae that we would refer to as a mycelium, that feeding body. And as long as there's plenty of nutrients, these hyphae are going to spread out and produce these spore bearing structures through asexual reproduction. So these are going to be genetically identical to the mycelium. And once they land on another piece of bread, they can continue to germinate and form more of these little hyphae. Uh, collectively, we would refer to that as another mycelium, another feeding body. And this could continue to eat the entire loaf of bread. But occasionally, these, my, uh, these mycelium from opposite I can't really say opposite sexes because it's not like there's a male and a female version of a fungus, but you'll see these complementary strands. They're sometimes marked with a plus and a minus. Uh, if two different hyphal threads from, from different mycelium merge together and, and want to go through this sexual reproduction process, there's two steps. And this is what I wanted to point out here on this slide. The first step, the first thing that happens when these two hyphae are going to go through sexual reproduction is that they fuse their cytoplasm without fusing their nuclei. So you've got two haploid nuclei where the cytoplasm fuses through what we call plasmogamy and you have this temporary stage in which there are cells that have two haploid nuclei. We call this the heterokaryotic stage. It's, it looks like this. You can see here individual hyphae that have haploid nuclei. One is marked red, the other one is marked blue. They're indicating two different hyphal threads that are complementary. And when they go through sexual reproduction, the first thing that they do, you can see here, is they uh, fuse their cytoplasm. They have not yet fused their nuclei, so we have this dikaryotic stage, a cell that has two nuclei. I can see this being a quiz or an exam question. Dikaryotic mycelium are, are a hyphal thread that has two haploid nuclei. It turns out that these dikaryotic mycelium can live longer than the ones that are haploid. In fact, some of the largest organisms are these dikaryotic mycelium that are the size of multiple football fields that live like up in Washington State underground in these, those huge forests where there's a bunch of dead, decaying wood that has to be decomposed, that nutrients has to be recycled so that new plants can grow. So these are some of the largest organisms, and we only see occasionally those reproductive structures that are the spore-bearing structures. So I'm going to flip back to this slide one more time. It's only in a few of these cells, and this is what we're going to see once again on Wednesday when we look at some more specific examples of fungus. We're going to see only in a few of these cells that go through meiosis, that are going to produce spores through this sexual process, uh, do those two nuclei fuse. When the two haploid nuclei fuse, that's what we call karyogamy or fusion of the nuclei. Two haploid nuclei fuse, that forms the first diploid cell, and we know that that first diploid cell is always called a zygote. 
In fungus, this diploid zygote immediately undergoes meiosis and produces these haploid spores. So sometimes spores can be produced sexually through meiosis, other times spores can be produced asexually without help from a partner. Um, when we look Wednesday at the different types of fungus, we're going to distinguish them based off of their sexual spore producing structures. In fact, each one of them are named after their structure that, that produces spores through meiosis. Zygomycota uh, produces spores through um, we're gonna, what we're going to call a zygosporangia. We're going to see uh, an ascocarp or a basidiocarp are going to be the names of those spore producing structures in each of those groups of fungus. So some general characteristics about fungus, we saw in the video that they are breaking down dead decom... Well, they can... cannot talk today for some reason. Uh, they break down dead plant material, primarily. They do feed on living cells, even though that's rare. Uh, we saw that hunting down the nematode. We see some other examples of uh, fungus feeding on living tissues in just a couple of slides. But the ones that are feeding on dead tissue Typically, this, uh, this is a dead log. A tree has fallen down. A mycelium has taken over and is decomposing the dead tissue. And we can see with all of its nutrients that it's stored up, it's putting out these little reproductive structures. So the body of the fungus is hidden in that log. And we can just see these basidiocarps that are popping out. We call these decomposers saprobes. Another way that a fungus can get nutrients is by breaking down living cells so they can be parasitic as well. Um, we see two examples of a fungus here. One is uh, basically breaking down corn cells. So this is what's called corn smut. There's another one that breaks down uh, wheat cells. So wheat rye is, uh, sorry, ergot, which is here on this wheat plant is another form of fungus that is breaking down living cells. So some fungus eat living plant cells. Other fungus we saw eating uh, living animal cells. This is that nematode worm that's getting trapped. There are some fungus that eat dead animal cells, like uh, athlete's foot is a fungus that eats the dead cells on the surface of your skin. So there's a bunch of different ways that fungus can get nutrients from the environment. One of the ways that we're going to see in a video on Wednesday is of this group called glomeromycota. These, this word just refers to a, a group of fungus that have an association with the root of a plant. So this, this term mycorrhiza that we see here, the first part just means fungus and the last part means root. So this describes an association between a root and a fungus. And we see two examples of these mycorrhiza. This picture over here shows an example of what we call an endo mycorrhiza. Endo because you can see the little pink staining structures. Those are hyphae from a fungus that have actually penetrated into some of the plant cells. These are root cells of a plant. We don't see any chloroplast in there, so that's one clue that we're looking at a root cell. And in those root cells, there are embedded these little hyphae. That, that's an endomycorrhiza. Before I describe what it's doing, let's look real quickly at the other picture. This is an ectomycorrhiza, which again are just a bunch of hyphal threads around the outside of a root tip. That, in, that large structure there is the tip of a root, and you can see how much smaller those individual hyphae are compared to the tip of a root. They're much smaller. So they're much better at pulling in water and nutrients from the environment. Roots that have this coating of mycorrhiza on them are much more efficient, like I said, at pulling in water and pulling in nutrients. And so they are going to outpace the plants that are growing around them. If you have, you know, we saw something like this earlier now that I'm thinking about it. Remember when we were talking about mesquite trees, we said mesquite trees have this association with bacteria in the ground. And they actually are kind of like farmers of these bacterial groups in the ground, those little nodes in the ground that were full of bacteria that fixed nitrogen. And while the, the bacteria fixed nitrogen, its fuel source was sugar. And, and the sugar was given to it by the plant. The plant had to contribute about 25% of the sugars that it made down to those bacterial populations in the ground. Um, it, 
seems like a drag on the plant later in life, but remember early in life, if the plant didn't have that access to additional nitrogen, it never would have grown and dominated the canopy. So we see a lot of the, the big coniferous forest, they, they have plants that if you go down into their roots, many of those plants have these associations with fungus because the ones that had an association with fungus could outpace the plants around it. Um, so you, you have a benefit early in life that you can grow faster than plants around you, but the downside is later in life you have to pay back a lot of the sugars that you make. And you can see over here this, the, the hyphal threads going to the interior of the plant. That is a, what allows them to basically extract the sugar. And then they're contributing water and minerals through those ectomycorrhiza. Again, all of these mycorrhiza are going to be part of that glomeromycota group. I had also mentioned that in this lecture, towards the end, which is where we're getting to now, uh, we would introduce lichens. And lichens are, there are two things. They are part fungus and part photosynthetic organism, I will say. Um, because most fungus, let me say that again. Most lichens are in association with a fungus and then some type of algae, like a green algae or a red algae. There are some lichens that are in association between fungus and not an algae at all, but a cyanobacteria, a prokaryotic photosynthetic cell. But whether it's a cyanobacteria or a green algae, uh, lichens are always part fungus and part photosynthetic organism. This is a, a picture of a lichen in which you can see these little cups. Those are the spore producing structures of the fungal part of this organism. We can see those cup shapes that tells us that we're talking about one of these cup fungus. Since we're kind of given some clues about where we would find these. Chytrids are the most primitive fungus. They're still aquatic. They have flagellated spores. Zygomycota, we're going to see these are the bread molds. We saw a short video of that. More videos on Wednesday. Glomeromycota are the ones that form that association with the roots of plants. And now we are here talking about cup fungus whose notable feature, I guess, would be that they are the main one that form lichens. You can see that when lichen has its reproductive structures and it forms these little cups. This is one type of lichen. Um, here's a cross section of an actual lichen and you can see that it's 75 to 80 percent fungus and only maybe 20 to 25 percent photosynthetic organism. This is one that is a lichen that's made out of green algae. So there's that single algal cell we know something about algae. We said algae is not adapted to life on land at all. It would quickly dry out, so it's, it has to stay aquatic. And the only reason that these algae separated from water is because they're enclosed in these little hyphal threads. Again, the hyphal threads are absorptive enough to pull even moisture out of the air, and they prevent these algae from completely drying out. So this mutualistic relationship is one where the, the photosynthetic organism gets a, a nice little home to live in that prevents it from drying out. And in return, the fungus gets food. This thing, if it has access to carbon dioxide and sunlight and it doesn't dry out, then it's going to supply this fungus with plenty of sugar. You can see how those algal uh, cells are up towards the surface, just underneath that top layer of hyphae so that they are exposed to the highest amount of sunlight and can produce a bunch of sugar for this uh, lichen. You can see the ascocarp, the cup shape that's producing those spores for the fungus. This is just reproducing the fungus part. If we're going to reproduce a lichen, these are the reproductive parts of a lichen. It's part little hyphal thread, part fungus, and then at least one algal cell. So part photosynthetic organism and part fungus, this is what we call a lichen. We'll see in lab as well as in the quiz, there are three common shapes of a lichen. This is just an actual slide of a lichen. Those red dots are the photosynthetic cells. There's the top layer of hyphae that's kind of densely woven together. And then here's the more loosely woven layer of hyphae. This is what fills with all the carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is uh, one of the shapes of a lichen that we will see. It's called the crustose lichen. These are typically formed with part fungus and part cyanobacteria. That's why they end up with these wild colors like this orange color. Even here, these little patches, that's a crustose lichen.
if you grab a couple of these sticks that we have over here and look closely on the, the stem, this is one in which it's, it's probably been in here for a couple of years, and these kind of leaf-like structures, these are all lichens that have lost their green color. But if you look directly on the surface of the stem, there's much smaller, these little crustose lichens. These even grow on tombstones and on rocks. You can see it growing on a piece of granite rock. There are also these foliose lichens, which is what you can see covering this branch. These are much more broad, kind of leaf-like. There is another branch that has been brought in here. If you want to look at this one, the, uh, this contains some foliose lichens that still retain their green color. And if you look around here, there's at least one right here that doesn't have these little broad patches on it. You can also see those cup shapes where this is an association with the cup fungus. There are some of these lichens that don't have the broad uh, leaf shapes. Instead, it's more of a bushy looking structure. These are called fruticose lichens, and we've got an example of one of them here. Uh, again, so lichen shapes come in either crustose, foliose, or fruticose. And then just the last couple of things here is just about fungal evolution. If you remember back in Unit 1, we said fungus made their way onto land about 475 million years ago, about the same time that plants made their way onto land. And we're going to see these trends in both fungus and in plants that they, at some point in their adaptations to life on land, are going to lose their flagellated sperm. They lose flagella at one point in their life cycle. So the oldest fungus that have been found are about 460 million years old. They still have these fungal spores. This is just a slide that probably needs to be updated. This epistheconts is an is a clade that would include animals and fungus. And the only thing we need to remember from this slide is that it shows us that fungus have a, I gotta say that again, uh, we share a more recent common ancestor with fungus than either, than fungus does with a plant. We're, we're more closely related to fungus, like we said, than fungus would be related to plants. So they have cell walls but yet they can't produce their own food. They are heterotrophs just like us. They, uh, like we said, digestive enzymes on the outside of the body where we have our digestive enzymes internally. And looking more closely at the fungus, you can see those primitive chytrid fungus are separated from the other four groups of fungus that we're going to look at on Wednesday. In fact, this is the last slide and it shows you what we have drawn on the board. Uh, we'll see these chytrid fungus with their little primitive flagella. We'll see examples of what we call bread molds. We'll see mycorrhiza fungus, we'll see cup fungus, and then these basidiocarps. What I also want to point out real quick is that some textbooks will refer to these clades of fungus uh, with the ending CTs. You can see this slide is calling the first group zygomycetes, the next group glomeromycetes, we've got ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. Another term that you see in describing these clades of fungus ends in the ending coda. These are, either one can be used. So I put this on the board just to expose you to both zygomycota and zygomycetes is describing the same thing. Glomeromycota and glomeromycetes describing the same clade. So ascomycota or ascomycetes, all the cup fungus, basidiomycota or basidiomycetes, all of these basidiocarps. These are the most common ones. Um, I've got examples of at least five different ones in the prep room that we will see on Wednesday. But with that ending uh, our slides, I'm going to turn one light on. And there is no new lab activity. There will be one on Wednesday.